Welcome to Practicing the Way. Before you get started, here are three ways to enhance your experience. First, this practice is designed to be done in community. And at practicingtheway.org, you'll find a companion guide and more tools to make this easy to run in a group. Secondly, the best way to start is by taking the Spiritual Health Reflection, a tool to guide you into a deeper layer of self-awareness around your spiritual formation. Finally, we've created a Rule of Life Builder, a digital aid to crafting your first rule in an easy-to-use template. All these resources and more are available for free at practicingtheway.org. Hello, everyone, and welcome to The Prayer Practice. I'm John Mark. I'm Christian. And I'm Yinka. And we're here to serve as your guides in a deepening life of prayer. You may have come on this practice because you're new to following Jesus and learning to pray for the very first time. Or you may be at a stage in your apprenticeship to Jesus where you desire not just to learn about God, but to experience God. Or you may just find prayer boring or tedious and you're curious what the deal even is. Wherever you are, and wherever you come from, you are welcome. To start, in the Library of Scripture, prayer is an umbrella term for all sorts of different types of interactions with God. But at its most basic, prayer is simply the medium through which we communicate and commune with God. In that sense, prayer isn't a practice at all, because all the practices or spiritual disciplines are a means to an end. Prayer, or life with God, is the end. The practice of prayer is learning to set aside dedicated time to intentionally be with God in order to become like Him and partner with Him to do what He's called us to do in the world. The practice of prayer is to life with God what our weekly date night is to our marriage. We live together seven days a week, but most Monday nights we go on a date, just the two of us to talk, sort things out, make eye contact, and just be together. We set aside focused time together to deepen our love all week long. In the same way, the practice of prayer is learning to set aside special moments to commune and communicate with God. But the end goal is to deepen your connection with God all the time. So our hope for this practice isn't that you just learn a theology of prayer or experiment with a new type of prayer, but that you would walk closer to God in your daily life. Over the next four sessions, the plan is to explore four stages of prayer. Talking to God. Talking with God. Listening to God. And being with God. When you are first learning to pray, there is a bit of a progression from one stage to the next. But the spiritual journey is not a linear progression, and you never mature beyond any dimension of prayer. The spiritual journey is less like a straight line and more like an ever-tightening spiral that we circle around over and over throughout our years. And the farther you go in the spiritual journey, the more all four types of prayer bleed together and it's all just life with God. Hmm. So you can think of these four types of prayer as stages in the spiritual journey or as layers by which we deepen our surrender to life with God. That said, up ahead for session one is talking to God. But before we get to the teaching, we think it's important to name where we're each at. We start every session with triads to create space for honest reflection. So pause the film, circle up with three or so people, and let's begin with a conversation about the coming practice. Here are a few questions to get you started. The first, what emotions does the word prayer elicit in your heart? Desire, guilt, burnout, joy? A second, what challenges do you face in prayer? Busyness, distraction, doubt? And the third, what invitation do you sense from God to go deeper in prayer? Take a few minutes to discuss and then we'll return for the teaching. Growing up, my mother was a first-generation follower of Jesus. When I was born, she was still learning how to pray. And when I was just a few years old, she was diagnosed with a rare autoimmune disorder and began to go deaf. 
The pain of her loss was her portal from a superficial Christian spirituality to a deeper life with God. As her hearing was fading day by day, she began to rise early in the morning to pray. And I just remember as a kid, no matter what time I got up, there she was, sitting in the armchair by the window, alone in the quiet, in prayer. At the time, daily prayer for me was a duty and honestly a bit of a drag. But it was clear to my young mind that she was experiencing something in prayer that I was not. For her, prayer was not a duty at all, but a delight. It was not until many years later when I went through my own season of pain and loss that I discovered the joy of prayer. But let's face it, for many of us, prayer is still a duty. We're all so busy, it's hard to find the time to pray, and if and when we do, it can be boring, and it's hard to focus. We get distracted by all the things on our to-do list, or as the spiritual writer Robert Mulholland once said, we just spend our time worrying in God's general direction. It can feel like talking to yourself or reading a Christmas list to the Santa in the sky. So we make excuses. I have young kids, or I have to go to work, or I'm an active personality, or whatever. And we feel the tinge of guilt, "Ah, I should pray more. Then we just pick up our phone and go about our day. Let me normalize this for you. We live in one of the most difficult times in all of human history to pray. The smartphone alone is a death blow to prayer for our entire generation. Not to mention social media, the internet, digital streaming, entertainment, noise pollution, urbanization, secularization, and Saturday morning soccer with the kids. My point is, if you struggle to pray, you are not alone. As St. Teresa of Avila used to say, when it comes to prayer, we're all beginners. And yet, prayer is the portal to life with God, the life we all crave in the deepest part of our being, whether we identify it as a desire for God or misidentify it as a desire for something else. Thankfully, Jesus was full of wisdom on prayer. On that note, turn in your Bibles to Luke chapter 11. Many people are beginning to read scripture on their phones, and that's just fine. But we recommend you carry a hard copy Bible with you to each session and follow along. Luke chapter 11, verse 1. One day, Jesus was praying in a certain place. Pause right there for a minute. We are dropping into the middle of a much larger story. And in the literary design of Luke's biography of Jesus, this is a running theme. In chapter 5, Luke writes, Jesus often withdrew to lonely places and prayed. In Luke 6, one of those days, Jesus went out to a mountainside to pray and spent the night praying to God. Or in Luke 9, Jesus took Peter, John, and James with him and went up onto a mountain to pray. Here he is again in Luke 11, praying. Keep reading. When he finished... One of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray, just as John taught his disciples. This is a fascinating request. Jesus did all sorts of amazing things, but the disciples do not ask Jesus to teach them how to heal the sick or how to cast out demons or perform miracles or even teach and preach. They ask him to teach them how to pray. My theory is it's because living with Jesus 24-7, watching his daily prayer rhythm and getting the -the behind-the-scenes view of his life, they realized that Jesus' extraordinary outer life with people was the byproduct of his even more extraordinary inner life with God. They were smart enough to intuit that, just like me and my mother, Jesus was experiencing something in prayer that they were not. Prayer for Jesus was not a duty but a delight. He seemed to really enjoy his father's company. In prayer, it's like Jesus was drinking from a deep well and they wanted a taste of the water. So right now, right where you are, I invite you to take a moment and make the disciples' prayer your own. Lord, teach us to pray. And if you're ready to apprentice under Rabbi Jesus and become a student in his school of prayer, pay close attention to what Jesus teaches his disciples to pray and how Jesus teaches his disciples to pray. A short word on each. First off, what Jesus teaches. He said to them in verse 2, 
When you pray, say, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, may your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us each day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, for we also forgive everyone who sins against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Protestants call this the Lord's Prayer, and Catholics the Our Father. And it's not just a liturgy or a pre-made prayer, it's also a theology or a theological orientation for prayer. It's a way of coming before God. A lot of people equate prayer with asking God to do things, but while asking is a key part of prayer, there's so much more to prayer. Notice, Jesus does not ask our Father for anything until midway through the prayer. The entire first half is orientation. Let me point out four theological truths from the Lord's Prayer that are Jesus' framework for all prayer. For Jesus, first off, God is our Father. Line one, our Father. Or in Aramaic, Jesus' mother tongue, Abba what a child would call their dad. In Jesus' day, that was a revolutionary way to address God. The New Testament scholar Joachim Jeremias writes, there is not a single example of the use of Abba as an address to God in the whole of Jewish literature. Yet it was Jesus' go-to name for God. He thought of God as his father and he taught his apprentices to do the same. I know this is really hard for some of you due to difficult relationships with your human fathers. But for Jesus, what comes to mind when you think about God will make or break your prayer life. My friend John Tyson from Pray New York City put it this way, unless you break the stronghold of false images of God in your mind, you'll never be drawn to prayer. For many of us, our journey into a deeper life of prayer must begin with the healing of our false images of who God is. If you think of God as an angry tyrant in the sky, mad at the world, waiting to just lay into you and lecture you with his disappointment, or as the cosmic life coach there to make you happy but who doesn't seem to deliver, you will not be drawn to prayer. But if you think of God as your father, that's a whole other story. When I get home from work, my kids don't grovel at my feet and say, Pastor Comer, welcome. They run up and give me a hug and immediately start telling me about their day or asking me for things. Can we go see a movie? Can we eat ice cream? Can we whatever? Because they know for all of my shortcomings as a dad, and there are many, I have a welcoming heart and good intentions toward them. The first thing Jesus has to teach us about prayer is that the God we come before has a welcoming heart of goodwill toward us. The primary emotional word used for God in both the Old and New Testaments is compassionate. And in Hebrew, it's referring to the feeling that a father, or more specifically, a mother, has toward their infant child. That is God's baseline emotional disposition toward you. Compassion, delight, tender care. He's our Father. Secondly, for Jesus, God is as close as the air. Line two, our Father goes on in heaven. Read the footnote in your Bible and you'll read that while most copies we have of Luke's version of the Lord's Prayer are shorter, some ancient manuscripts add on the full version of the Lord's Prayer found in the other Gospels, in heaven. Now, Heaven is a tricky word because in English, when most people read heaven, they think of a place that you go when you die. But while there's truth in that, in Greek, the word is uranos. It's actually plural, the heavens. More literally, it just means the air or the atmosphere. Hear it this way, our Father in the air. Think about that. The air is all around you, up against your skin, inside your body. It's in your blood. That's how close the availability of God's presence is. Jesus is teaching his apprentices that when we come to our Father in prayer, he's not far away in outer space, but closer to us than we are to ourselves. Third, for Jesus, the primary goal of prayer is the worshipful enjoyment of our Father's company. 
The next line is, hallowed be your name. That's another tricky word to translate into English. Basically, to hallow means to revere and respect the holiness of God. And to be holy means to be unique and special and beautiful. To say God is holy is to say there is no other being in all the cosmos more radiant than he. The Presbyterian Timothy Keller in his book, Prayer, writes, to hallow God's name is to have a heart of grateful joy toward God and even more a wondrous sense of his beauty. When you begin to pray, to commune with God, and you begin to enter into the inner life of the Father and the Son and the Spirit and share in their love and joy and peace, you realize they radiate beauty. And as you are caught up in and enveloped into the beauty of God, you can't help but desire for others around you to see God for who he really is. The Anglican theologian N.T. Wright translates, Hallowed be your name, this way. May you be worshipped by your whole creation. May the whole cosmos resound with your praise. May the whole world be freed from injustice, disfigurement, sin, and death. Here is Jesus in loving worship of his Father. Think about how different Jesus' approach to prayer is from our own. Often we come to God to get things from God that we feel we need to be happy. This is one of the reasons we tend to pray mostly when our career or relationships or life circumstances are under threat. And that's fine. But it's also a gentle sign from our own heart that for most of us, we are still searching for happiness outside of God. God himself has yet to become our happiness. But for Jesus, the first goal of prayer is just to enter into the beauty of God. And when you do that, you can't help but desire the world around you to experience his beauty. Finally, for Jesus, our prayers really do make a difference. Jesus' next line is, your kingdom come. May your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Notice Jesus assumes that his kingdom has not yet come and that his will is not yet done. In part, yes, but not in full. And he assumes that through prayer, we partner with him to bend reality in the direction of our Father's wisdom and good intentions that through prayer we drag the future age of the kingdom of God into this age. Now, much more could be said about the Lord's Prayer, but for right now, think of how different this is from how many of us approach God. One, we think of God as a grumpy dictator or a cosmic vending machine, not as our Father. Two, we think He's far away in outer space, not as close as the air. Three, we think the main point of prayer is to get things from God, what Mulholland called symptom management, not to delight in God himself. And four, we assume that what's going to happen is going to happen with or without our prayers, not that prayer really makes a difference. No wonder we avoid prayer. So that's what Jesus teaches his disciples to pray. But that can sound a bit overwhelming, right? I mean, where do we even start? Well, Next, look at how Jesus teaches his disciples to pray. He does not start by teaching them to say whatever is on their mind. Nothing wrong with that at all, but he starts by saying, when you pray, say. The New Testament scholar Scott McKnight argues that verse 2 can be translated, whenever you pray, recite this. Jesus is tapping into the first century Hebrew custom of praying memorized or pre-made prayers. This is what we mean by talking to God, praying pre-made prayers that someone else, in this case, Jesus himself, created for followers of Jesus across the world and down through history to pray. Let me give you a few examples of pre-made prayers. The Lord's Prayer is the most famous in the New Testament. It was prayed three times a day by the first Christians and still is by the monastic orders. Second, the Psalms, which are called the prayer book of the Bible, because most of them were designed not to be read, but to be prayed. Third, Scripture itself. Many people find great life in praying Scripture back to God, calling on God to fulfill His promises. Four, singing. There's a power in prayer that is set to music. St. Augustine famously said, to sing is to pray twice. 
We don't think of modern worship music as liturgical, but it is. It's a pre-written prayer that we are all praying together to God. But there's also, fifth, formal liturgy in more historic streams of the church, like the Book of Common Prayer or the Liturgy of the Hours. And six, in today's world, we have apps on our phone that guide you through prayer as you drive to work or walk your dog in the park. These are all examples of talking to God with pre-made prayers. This type of prayer is very helpful in a number of situations. When you're first learning to pray, think of how children learn to write by tracing letters and then words on a page before they write on their own. This is how God wired the brain to grow, by copying and imitation. And this is a great way to learn how to pray. Or when you're traveling and away from your daily prayer rhythm, you're on an airplane or in a hotel room or in the back of a car and you don't have the habit cues of your home life. Or when you're exhausted and can't focus your mind very well because you have a newborn or you didn't sleep well the night before or you're in a demanding season of school or work or caregiving. When you're emotionally or physically unwell. When you long for greater articulation in your prayer and you're searching for the right words to express your heart to God. Or when you're in what St. John of the Cross called the dark night of the soul. A season where you don't feel God's presence like you used to. In these situations and more, this can be a really helpful way to pray. Now, there are limitations to this type of prayer. It can feel impersonal or inauthentic or intellectual. It's very important with pre-made prayer in particular that we slow down and bring our heart's intention to the prayer, lest it become rote. But if we open our heart to God in this way, We tap into a quiet power that is running underneath the surface of the kingdom of God. We are praying with the communion of the saints, adding our voice to millions around the world and down through history. We are praying with articulation and theological weight and beauty. We are guarding our mind from distraction and guiding it into God's presence and purposes. These pre-made prayers are a kind of scaffolding for building a temple of the Holy Spirit in our body. So, this coming week, our practice is to begin to develop your own daily prayer rhythm and to explore what and where and when and how to pray. We have all sorts of recommendations for you, but really, there's no right way to pray. The Catholic scholar Ronald Rollheiser writes, There is no bad way to pray and no single starting point for prayer. The spiritual masters offer one non-negotiable rule. You have to show up for prayer and show up regularly. Everything else is negotiable and respects your unique circumstances. So as you practice, remember, the ultimate aim of prayer is not to master a discipline. It's not to master anything. It's to be mastered and as a result, be set free. The point of prayer is to open our heart to God to offer deeper and deeper parts of our life and world to him to heal and save and move farther down the path toward what ancient Christians called union with God. Union is the answer to Jesus' own prayer for his disciples in John 17. Father, just as you are in me and I am in you, may they also be in us or united with us that the world may believe that you have sent me. As the 14th century Englishwoman Julian of Norwich once said, the whole reason why we pray is to be united into the vision and contemplation of God to whom we pray. Whether you pray the Lord's Prayer or Psalm 23 or Gregorian chant, the whole point is just to live more and more of our days receiving and giving the love of the Father and the Son and the Spirit. And while we never arrive, that is our ultimate aim and prayer is the way. So, as you begin, I can't think of a better place to start than the disciples' simple request, Lord, teach us to pray. Now it's time for a conversation about the teaching. Circle up with your group and talk through the following three questions. 
The first, what stuck out to you from the teaching? Was there a scripture or thought that especially resonated with you? Second, are pre-made prayers a part of your life with God or not? And the third, what support do you need from this community as we go on this journey with God? Take a few minutes for conversation. I'm Neil Smith, and this is my wife. I'm Stephanie, and we have two kids, Sage and Caleb. In those moments of when I'm feeling, you know, really dry and feeling like, ah, I'm just really not getting anything out of prayer, something that I have found incredibly helpful is to kind of pray scripture. One of the key ones for me has been praying the Lord's Prayer, especially in the morning. And to be honest, sometimes that looks like just repeating it you know, word for word, almost kind of like a liturgy. And then other times it looks more like me expounding on that and really diving deeper into like, yes, Lord, your kingdom come here in Portland, your, your kingdom come in our kids' lives. I'm really getting specific. But I think that having kind of like a base prayer that helps me just align with where am I going? What do I want to see God do? Almost having like that be a ritual and a routine that I kind of like every morning I come back to has been a really big gift, um, especially in those dry seasons. I think one of the amazing things about using the Lord's Prayer as a, a method or a way of praying in the morning is if you're anything like me and you wake up and you're groggy and you're tired and you're flooded with anxieties or uh, problems for the day, to-dos for the day, uh, things that you need to get done. This idea of just having the structured prayer that I can return to day after day, time and time again. Um, a prayer that I can, as Stephanie mentioned, sometimes I am praying this uh, just literally going through the words and just kind of reminding myself of those truths. Um, and sometimes I'm praying through those themes, but having something that in the midst of the chaos of my mind um, and the tiredness of my body uh, that I can just return to again and again and again has been an incredible gift to me. Practice in the ways built on the conviction that information alone is not enough to yield transformation. To change, we need to do what Jesus said, put his teaching into practice. So our goal for this coming week isn't just to learn about prayer, but to practice prayer. After all, the best way to learn how to pray is by praying. Everything we offer is invitational. We make recommendations, you make decisions. So feel free to adapt this practice to your life situation. But this is our best attempt to guide you into a deeper life of prayer. Each week's exercises are written out for you in the companion guide. If you didn't get one from your group leader, we have plenty available at practicingtheway.org, either as a free download or an in-print on-demand version. We recommend the print version so you can stay off your phone as much as possible while in prayer. We have three exercises for you this coming week. The first is to create a daily prayer rhythm. Decide on a time and a place to pray, if possible, daily. Create some routines or rituals to make your time of prayer something you look forward to all day long. Some people light a candle or put on worship music. I normally make a cup of tea and then have this chair I like to sit in each morning as I pray. Those of you who are more kinesthetic may find it helpful to pray while you walk or be in nature or with something to keep your hands busy, like knitting or drawing. Work with your personality, not against it. The second is to pick out a pre-made prayer and talk to God. Try using one of the sources we mentioned earlier, the Lord's Prayer, the Psalms, Scripture, singing, liturgy, or apps. If you don't have a strong preference, we recommend you start by praying the Psalms. You can start in Psalm 1 and pray to the right, or in the companion guide, we have recommended Psalms to start with based on your emotional state. 
Also, each week we have a reach exercise for those of you who have the time, energy, and desire to go further in prayer. Week one's reach exercise is to use the Lord's Prayer as a template and pray through each section for a total of about 15 minutes. We have written instructions for you in the guide as well as video tutorials online from Strawn Coleman. We also have recommended reading for those of you who want to follow along and continue to learn. For this practice, we're reading Praying Like Monks and Living Like Fools by Tyler Staten. And this week we're reading chapters one to three. As well as the Rule of Life podcast from Practicing the Way. For those of you who want to listen in on a conversation with John Mark and others to learn more about prayer. But this coming week, as we follow Jesus together, may Jesus teach you to pray to commune and communicate with our Father and lead you into deeper life of union with His Spirit.